The women are in France. Now the danger is for real in Wish Me Luck. Two of London's top football managers, Ron Smart and Ron Slack, are in the race to sign United star player. So it's the early morning shuttle to Manchester. Using Hertz Super Shuttle Drive, Ron Smart rents his car in the British Airways departure lounge. He gets Hertz computerized driving directions and a rate that includes everything, even petrol. Ron Slack will rent his car in Manchester. On arrival, while Ron Slack is queuing to do his paperwork, Ron Smart walks straight to his car. Ron Slack has to rely on local driving directions. So Ron Smart beats his rival by a short head thanks to Hertz. And Ron Slack beats his head until it hurts. Using his Hertz optional phone, Ron Smart gives his chairman the good news. But Ron Slack will have to wait to break the news of his signing. You'll fly with Hertz Super Shuttle Drive. Do you want to see a really fast estate agent at work? Do you want to see it again? There you have it. Black Horse Agencies. Accurate valuations and thorough local knowledge from people who are specially trained. Altogether, a much smarter move. Happiness is a cigar called Hamlet, the mild cigar. This week, the Mail on Sunday no! and America's foremost sports magazine take a close, not too close, look at what makes Super Bowl America's greatest sporting event. The Sports Illustrated Guide to Super Bowl. Free with the mail on Sunday. A newspaper, not a snooze paper. Cogs need really effective medicine. Benelin expectorant, warm, soothing and highly effective for the proper relief you need. Benelin, the number one name for coughs. All sorts of stories is told about the day they invented new fruit wheat. One was, old Jake weren't too particular about maintaining his combine. if he didn't land right up in the middle of McCafferty's vineyard. As for all them juicy raisins, they landed right up in the middle of fruit wheats. First cereal with real fruit in every bite. Folks called it some kind of breakthrough, which I guess was more or less the words McCafferty used. The women are in France now. The danger is for real in Wish Me Luck. Next Saturday at 7.15, Roger Moore is James Bond 007 in The Man with the Golden Gun. Please, I thought this would never happen. Stand back, girls. You're not thinking that. I sure am, boy. Licensed to thrill, 007 faces The Man with the Golden Gun. Next Saturday at 7.15 on TBS. Next tonight, we join ITN for the latest news. That's after the break. I can't.
can't stop writing. Look at Shakespeare. 39 plays, 154 sonnets. What a scribbler. I spend hours writing checks. I can't stop. Would it help if I presented my bill now? I can't resist all those spaces to fill in. The amount in figures, the amount in words, the date. Have you never heard of Barclays Bank? I'm not daft. I'll be the judge of that. Look at this. A credit card? It's a Barclays Connect card. Thousands of Barclays customers have one. It's exactly the same as paying by check at Visa outlets. All you have to do is to sign your name. Debits your current account direct. A Barclays Connect card. I'm cured. <laughs> what name shall I put on the bill? Uh, Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte. When you put Esso petrol or diesel in your tank, you're not only getting quality you can count on, you're getting an Esso Tiger token for every six pounds worth of fuel you buy. And whether you're a high or low mileage driver, you have a variety of quality gifts to choose from. Collect your Tiger tokens and put a Tiger in your tank. Where you see the Esso collection sign. From the New York skyline to the New York skyline. From New York's night spots to New York's night spots. New York State has more to offer than you ever dreamed of. And it's all yours on Pan Am, the official I Love New York airline. With three flights a day to New York, Pan Am Express flights to Syracuse, Rochester, and Albany, and some great holidays for you to explore it all. Call Pan Am now for our brochure. The new Sunsil conditioner is a rich, light mousse that rinses easily away, leaving your hair in beautiful condition. Sunsilk's new conditioner. It's the secret of life in your hair. You could get cheaper motor insurance by dealing direct with the insurance service. If it comes to the crunch, you'll be glad you did. The insurance service, 0272 232 232. If you're thinking it's about time you moved house, you'll find more town, country and overseas properties in the classified sections of the Times and the Sunday Times than in all the other quality national newspapers put together. To place your advertisement in Times Classified, phone 01 481 4000. The gospel stops your ma fearing like a... In May, the entire ITV network will combine resources for the first time to produce 27 hours of non-stop live television to raise money for charity. Wherever you live, you can help us raise millions during ITV Telethon 88. Into the Aspel and Company arena this week, a flick, a plonker, and a cock-up collector. Felicity Kendall, Nicholas Lindhurst, and Dennis Norton. Will it be all right on the night? Wait and see. Aspel and Company, tonight at 10. The news from ITM. Owen warns we're ready to fight the Alliance for every seat. Two young brothers murdered, a man is held. The cup tie chaos caused by fake tickets. And Broad's 500 pound tantrum down under. Good evening. Dr. David Owen has said he's prepared to fight any merged party for every parliamentary seat at the next election. Dr. Owen told a rival rally at the SDP's merger conference in Sheffield let no one doubt our resolve or our commitment.
And he rallied his supporters against the merger with the taunt, let the faint hearts leave while the strong hearts stay. The party votes on the merger tomorrow. This was the SDP breaking up in sadness and bitterness. One speaker even getting a slow hand clap. Shirley Williams saying merger was right because it was the majority view. She understood the anti-mergerites leaving. And in turn, they, I hope, will accept the determination of those of us who speak here for the majority of the members of the Social Democratic Party, that we stand firm on the bedrock on which our party was created. One member, one vote. Democracy. They rehearsed the arguments for and against merger one last time. I am not leaving any party. I'm taking social democracy with me into the new party, just as the Liberals are taking liberalism. One anti-merger speaker Join resented Shirley Williams' enthusiasm for the new party. Well, I have something to say to you, Madam President. I won't join you, and you won't run me out. Following last night's row, the anti-merger side laid claim to the hall tonight. David Owen made as grand, as determined an entrance as any politician, and gave us tougher warning, too, to the planned new party. Don't expect any deals from us, he said, the continuing SDP. Well, let it be clear, the SDP will neither provoke nor shirk a fight. If need be, we are ready to fight every seat at the next election. No one should doubt our resolve or our commitment. But I predict the day will come when the SDP is seen to be closer to the heartbeat of this nation than any other political party. Before the meeting began, Dr Owen's people were calling it just a business meeting, but it was very obvious that here tonight was the relaunching of Dr Owen's SDP. Michael Brunson, ITN, Sheffield. A new poll tonight shows Mr Steele's standing as Liberal leader has dropped sharply over the past month. The Murray poll in tomorrow's Sunday Times shows 46% satisfied with Mrs Thatcher, 33% with Mr Kinnock and 23% with Mr Steele. Compared with last month, Mrs Thatcher and Mr Kinnock are each down by 2%, but Mr Steele by 7%. Concern about unemployment and education have both gone down in the past month, while worries about the health service are up by 12%. It's now the issue of greatest concern. Police are questioning a man tonight about the killing of two young brothers at their Luton home. 27-year-old Colin Munn gave himself up in Oxfordshire this evening. He's been taken back to Luton, where he lived with the boys and their mother. The bodies of the two brothers were found together in a bedroom of the family's terraced home in Luton. Their mother, 29-year-old Jennifer Knight, found them when she returned home early this morning after a night out with two girlfriends. Mrs Knight was herself attacked and was taken to hospital with serious head injuries. Police said she'd been repeatedly beaten with a blunt instrument. After the discovery of the bodies of six-year-old Matthew Knight and his four-year-old brother Ryan, police began a nationwide search for 27-year-old Colin Munn, who's lived with Mrs Knight for the past three years. He'd been left to look after the two boys yesterday evening. Earlier this evening, he gave himself up to police in Oxfordshire, and he's now back in Luton talking to local detectives. Mrs Knight is now said to be out of danger, but still in intensive care. Detectives say it'll be tomorrow before she's well enough to be questioned about what they describe as a brutal and sickening double murder. Alan Cuthbertson, ITN, Luton. The Siemens Union has called an indefinite national ferry strike starting on Tuesday. It's in support of strikers who've been sacked by the Isle of Man Steam Packet Company. Sealink and European ferries said the action could put jobs at risk and tonight called on their men to continue working normally. In the Isle of Man dispute, the ferry companies sacked 161 seamen after they went on strike in protest at plans to cut jobs, holidays and pay. The company says it will recruit new workers. The Siemens Union see this as part of a wider plot against them. We believe that the ferry operators are combining against the National Union of Seamen. In particular, local agreements are coming under attack. Uh, agreements that have been negotiated freely and entered into from the last eight years and even longer than that uh, have been torn up. Uh, companies are just stating to people exactly what they will do in the future. Uh, 
negotiation really is a dirty word. There's no negotiations going on. It's just threat. And our people basically are saying they've had enough. So 5,000 seamen at 12 British ports have been asked to strike indefinitely from Tuesday. A union spokesman said members at each port could decide whether to hold a ballot or not. Israeli troops have shot and wounded at least eight Palestinian protesters in the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. Doctors at one hospital in Nablus said 15 Palestinians were treated for gunshot wounds. The casualties included an 11-year-old boy who'd been shot through the neck. Orders to use gunfire in the West Bank town of Nablus came after protests in support of the PLO swept through the community. Army units came under repeated attack from groups of stone throwers. They first tried to break them up with an aerial assault, this helicopter dropping tear gas. When they didn't succeed, a water cannon went in, but that failed to douse the resistance also. The army finally resorting to live ammunition. Shots fired down alleyways. The ultimate deterrent, which the army says should only be used when soldiers' lives are endangered. The gunfire set off panic. But not all screaming in fear. You are not afraid from the army. No! no, no! The return of rifle fire and more casualties shattered the army's orders to use beatings and not bullets against protesters. In Gaza, though, it was different. Golani Brigade soldiers crushing dissent. It was nothing more than one arrest. Soldiers supposedly doing their duty. Soldiers Israel is relying on to maintain control. Brent Sadler, ITN, in Israel's occupied territories. South African police are denying allegations that they failed to prevent clashes between rival black factions in which five people were reported killed. The trouble at the KTC squatter camp near Cape Town revived memories of similar violence in 1986. This report has been compiled under South African government restrictions. After a two-year lull, pools of smoke once again hang over the KTC squatter camp. In the streets, residents scramble to salvage some of their possessions from burning shacks, and scores of homeless people are seeking refuge in neighboring townships. The residents say the fighting erupted after a squatter leader was murdered, his followers seeking to exact revenge on what they call the young radicals, allegedly responsible for the killing. Police deny the violence has a political motive, describing it as a clash between rival black gangs. Observers feared the fighting could escalate as it did in 1986, when more than 50 people were killed and thousands of shacks raised in conflict between conservative blacks and the more radical so-called comrades. Squatters have alleged in court that on that occasion, police aided the conservative faction. But today, apart from a few shacks still burning, calm appears to have returned to the area, and the authorities have confirmed that order has been restored. Mike Hanna, ITN, South Africa. And now, on a day of upsets in the FA Cup and bad temper on England's cricket tour, here's Giles Smith. The big shock of the FA Cup came from third division Port Vale, who beat last year's finalist Tottenham 2-1. Ray Walker got the first in a well-earned victory that ends manager Terry Venable's hopes of bringing success to Spurs in his first season back in English soccer. Second division Bradford beat first division Oxford 4-2. And Orient of the fourth gave Nottingham Forest a fright before Calvin Plummer's goal saw Forest home 2-1. There were victories for Arsenal over Brighton and Manchester United over Chelsea. But Coventry, the FA Cup holders, are out, beaten 1-0 by Watford. The only goal came from a speculative free kick, which the Coventry for defence failed to clear. A Malcolm Allen shot somehow found the head of Trevor Senior for a goal that even the Watford manager admitted had a bit of luck. It was also Cup Day in Scotland and the holders there, St Mirren, went out too, beaten 3-0 at home by Clydebank. Frank McAvenny scored as Celtic scraped home 1-0 against 2nd Division Stranra. But probably the most dramatic events of the day were at Loftus Road, where QPR beat West Ham 3-1. The match was held up for an hour after fans spilled onto the pitch. Watching was a group of police from the German cities where England play this summer. They'd come to check up on crowd control. The West German police had chosen their match carefully. A big operation was already underway by the time they arrived. The West London police, though, were determined to keep the peace, despite the reputation of a small section of West Ham supporters. For a while, everything went according to plan. The police video, one of their main weapons in winning the fight against violence, was inevitably the centre of attention. But as everyone settled down to watch the match, something happened which even the police couldn't have predicted. The holders of around 2,000 forged tickets had joined a section of West Ham supporters 
already closely packed together. The only escape was onto the pitch. The only answer was to take off the players and find a new home for the evicted fans. But in Rangers' tight stadium, that wasn't easy. An amiable sort of chaos reigned for just over an hour before order was finally restored. The horses were marched off and the teams trooped back on. There was another short delay while the carpet was cleaned, but the whole affair had been remarkably good-humoured. The Germans didn't quite understand the joke, but they were obviously impressed, if only by the fans' patience. And that was rewarded by a second half, the opposite of the shambles which had gone before. First, David Pisani giving Rangers the lead. Three minutes later and West Ham tore back in to equalise. Tony Cotty finishing it. But Rangers had always looked the more organised of the two sides. It wasn't long before they took the lead again. Gary Bannister curling one around the keeper. And just to rub in the West Enders' superiority, another great solo effort sealed it. This one from Martin Allen. A potentially explosive London derby had ended happily. The German police must have been the most relieved. Peter Staunton, ITN Sport, Loftus Road. There was drama too in cricket where Chris Broad was fined £500 for smashing a stump after getting out in the bicentenary test. The scores at the end of the second day, Australia 14 for no wicket in reply to England's 425. 107 minutes the day began badly for England, Mike Gatting went for just 13 and then came the moment of madness from Broad. On 139 he misjudged a ball from war and the petulant swipe ruined a fine innings. Broad was reprimanded for refusing to walk in Pakistan. After all that happened there and the warnings that followed, this display of temper was bound to land him in trouble. There's absolutely no possible excuse for knocking your stumps over when you're dismissed. However disappointed you are. And no alternative. They all knew the form before the match started, what the position would be, and I find him £500. He knows he was wrong, and that's it. Further indiscipline could lead to players involved being sent home. A reflective broad then sat and watched as Bill Affey built on England's solid foundation. Good shot. Spinner Peter Taylor applied the break. He picked up Affy for 37. Got him, got him. Bruce French lifted the total past 400. And as England got a whiff of victory, wicketkeeper Dyer got the strong smell of leather. A nasty blow on the nose, but nothing was broken. Marsh and David Boone survived 40 minutes at the end. They'll have to bat a long time tomorrow to start enjoying this bicentenary party. Mark Austin, ITN Sport, Sydney. Athletics and Zola Bud's return to British competition at the cross-country trial at Gateshead brought controversy when anti-apartheid protesters tried to stop the race with Bud in fourth place. They were quickly hustled away, but it was an unhappy afternoon for Zola, who could only manage fourth place, 36 seconds behind the winner, Angela Tooby. No problems for the world's fastest man, Ben Johnson, setting another world record in Toronto, 5.15 seconds for the 50 yards and already looking in fine form for the Olympics. Finally, back down under, the Prince of Wales has been facing up to some heckling by Aborigine protesters. They shouted boring during his speech, though most of the audience gave him a warmer reception. A small group of Aboriginal protesters airing their familiar claim for land rights awaited the royal couple when they arrived in Wollongong. Prince Charles, there to open a new arts centre, was about to speak when one of the demonstrators shouted boring. The prince reacted quickly. Before anybody uh, shouts boring, I'm about to make the most boring speech I've ever made. But as the heckling continued, the prince's patience clearly began to wear thin. Could you repeat yourselves? I didn't quite catch it. However, the rest of Wollongong seemed pleased enough to see the prince and princess. In the town hall, Princess Diana shook hands with a seemingly endless line of local dignitaries. If anyone had a right to shout boring, it was surely Her Royal Highness. In her only speech of the tour, made in somewhat calmer circumstances, the princess opened Adelaide's Youth Festival with the thought about her own young family back home. Like most people with small children, I often wonder what sort of world our sons will inhabit in the next century. When I meet people like you all here today, I am encouraged to believe that the future will, after all, be something to look forward to. All in all, a mixed day for the two royal speakers. Jeremy Thompson, ITN, Australia. And you can see an ITN special programme, The Prince and Princess of Wales in Australia, tomorrow on ITV. It's on at different times in different regions.
And that's the news this Saturday evening from all of us here at ITN. A very good evening. Stand by for tonight's meeting of Aspel and Company. Felicity Kendall, Nicholas Lindhurst and Dennis Norden. See you in a couple of minutes. The weather now. It will be a mostly dry night with a minimum temperature near zero degrees Celsius and a widespread ground frost with slippery patches on roads. Tomorrow morning will be bright with sunny spells and occasional showers, but during the afternoon it will be drier but cloudy with a top temperature of eight degrees Celsius. And that's the weather. Wish me luck. Liz and Matty have arrived in France and their mission's underway. So far, so good then. I shan't be happy till they make radio contact. They sit there in London, shifting their coloured pins around. Do they know how long wireless operators are lasting on average? And it's time we up the average, isn't it? I don't know who you are, but you must leave, first thing. And if you're thinking of transmitting from this room, forget it. A first taste of real danger. Wish me luck, Sunday at 8.15 on TBS. So, two years in New York, and he thinks he can tell us how to run things. Well, we won't have it. It's all right. I fix things. He's traveling overnight on the red eye. Not first class. Of course not. Company policy. By the time he gets in, he'll be exhausted. And he won't have had time to incorporate those new figures I sent him in his report. He'll be hungry and tired. I've arranged for the chauffeur to bring him straight here, not to the hotel. Like a lamb to the slaughter, gentlemen. Good morning. New Club World delivers the businessman ready to do business. Pleasant trip. Yes, thank you. New Club World from the world's favorite airline. Watch carefully, do everything that I do. Right. I'm taking a cigar out of my box, mm -hmm. I'm throwing it away. I'm taking another one, I'm throwing it away. And another one, I'm throwing it away. Still another one, and yet one more. And now stop, let's compare boxes. You've got one left. Well, no, actually, Hugh, I've got six marvellously mild Panama cigars left because I'm not such a donkey as to throw my cigars away. But I think you're getting the idea. Anyone who doesn't buy Panama must have a cigar missing. I could do with a Monday morning Getting out of bed and yawning I could do with a day I could do without the nine to five Got to work hard to survive Ooh. I could do with a day I could do without the British weather And both of my feet are killing me I could do with a day I could do with a day If you're in the market for a personal pension, of all the companies you could talk to, we like to think we are the brightest. Amiable, capable, professional, legal, and general. Ha! Good news here for ex-millionaires and the rest of us who've been flat by the stock market. The Times portfolio game pays out £4,000 a day, be it money, and £8,000 on Saturday. But now you also automatically qualify for the Times Portfolio Accumulator, which could win you 20,000 this week. And if it rolls up, you could accumulate 100K or more. Your personal portfolio card is in tomorrow's Sunday Times magazine. Now, that's what I call champagne money. The McDonald's Quarter Pounder is so beefy, with so many trimmings, we thought you might like some extra fries to go with it. So order a Quarter Pounder and large fries and we'll give you 25% more fries free. McDonald's Quarter Pounder. The beefed up hamburger with beefed up fries. This month, when you make a deposit worth five pounds at Sketchly, we'll credit you with one pound. Every time. 
big match live Sunday 2.30. It's the FA Cup fourth round and the runaway leaders of the first division, Liverpool, take on Aston Villa, one of the outstanding teams in the second. The big match live, Aston Villa versus Liverpool, Sunday 2.30 on ITV. Tonight, the world according to Smith and Jones. This is hopelessly and incurably insane. A condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. <laughs> That's all right, Mr. Kenny. I'm Inspector Fabian. The police forces, of course, are not always as disciplined and restrained as the British Bobby. Here, the Tokyo Met carry out a routine interrogation. <laughs> the world according to Smith and Jones. Tonight at 10.45 on TBS. Over on Channel 4 at the moment, more medical matters in the Black Forest Clinic. On TVS, Aspel and Company. What a discreet audience. Uh, good evening. I have to answer a few queries about last week's show. After Kenny Everett appeared with a huge bald dome and three feet of hair sticking out at each side, two viewers rang in to ask if he was wearing a wig. Well, <laughs> yes, he was. Either that or he's got a nasty case of alopecia. And uh, several people wanted to know what Joan Collins said at the end of the show when she touched my shoulder and whispered in my ear. Well, mind your own business. <laughs> so what really happened was, and you have a right to know, she leaned forward, she flicked a speck of dandruff off my lapel, and she murmured, Darling, what did you say your name was? <laughs> I told her it was George Hamilton. <laughs> well, I don't want her writing and phoning up all the time. I had enough of that with Nora Batty. <laughs> so to tonight's show, I should be offering hospitality to a man who doesn't think nostalgia is a thing of the past. That's Dennis Norton. To the much admired and even more desired, Felicity Kendall, and to the actor who has brought new dignity to the word plonker. Nicholas Lindhurst. <laughs> but first, I am delighted to announce that in our royal box tonight, we are honoured with the presence of the nation's most eminent parents-to-be, their Royal Highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of York. Uh, may I, on behalf of the entire world, offer you our congratulations on the happy news? Uh, yeah, we were absolutely delighted and thrilled that Edward finally got a job. Yeah. <laughs> well, the other happy news about the Duchess being, you know, expecting... Um... Oh, you, you mean that Fergo's up Stump Alley? <laughs> I should, Coco. Harry Preggers, take the hell. Frog in the pod, you name it. Well, yes, I mean, uh, do you have a name? Uh, yeah, um, it's Prince Andrew. <laughs> well, you're obviously on cloud nine, but how did you react when you found out? Oh, Brill. Well, we got out the chopper and did a victory roll. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went flying. <laughs> <laughs> what is the, uh, the procedure when you find out that you are in the royal family uh, way? Well, uh, first we told those closest to us, you know, Sir Alistair Burnett. And uh, then we told the family. Uh, Your Royal Highness, I, I, are you feeling quite well in yourself? Uh, he means morning sickness, uh, Fergs. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't had morning sickness since I stopped watching Anne Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> well, mind you, I had a bit of evening sickness when I heard. <laughs> Six bottles of shampoo, 17 well. stickies, and a game of high well. cockalorum in the wardroom. <laughs> Bravo! I don't wish to be too personal, but of course it does mean that you will be losing your figure. I do hope so. <laughs> do, do you have any preference for sex, sir? Uh, I beg your pardon? <laughs> sex, I mean, uh, would you like a girl? What? Here? You don't subtle old picnic rug. Not in, not in front of the old battleship when she's about to drop anchor. 
Perhaps you'd like a boy to follow in the family tradition. Oh, yeah, I've yeah. Gordon's town, the military, and if he's no bloody good, he can work for Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> yeah, as assistant Wimpo Mincer in the Wooster biz. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both very much indeed for joining us tonight. Oh, I enjoyed it immensely. Oh, yeah, it was a real pleasure for us, you know, the three of us <laughs> to uh, be here. Uh, the three of us? Yeah. Oh, what, oh. you, me and Michael? Oh, we're not calling him Michael, Andy. It's a dreadfully common name. We're calling him Kevin. Right? No, uh, Trevor. What about Barry? Uh, Barry. No, Barry. Uh, Wayne. What about Dennis? <laughs> Well, I'm, uh, I'm sure we all wish their Royal Highnesses the best of luck and we thank them for being with us tonight. Now, here is a young man whose career as a child star came to an end when he suffered a devastating outbreak of acne. But he steered his skin and made his name as one of Britain's cleverest comic actors, Nicholas Lyndhurst. <laughs> Clean pair of shoes, Nicholas. Yes, aren't they? Yes, yes, brand new. Excellent. Now, tell me about this uh, acne. How bad was it? Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't so terrible. But uh, because I'd done a lot of chocolate bar commercials when I was a kid, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, a lot. it was. It was really uh, the fact that I was growing so quickly, and, and the fact that the voice was up and down and all over the place. You weren't fattened, acne, was No, it? I wasn't fattened. No, I was skinny and acne. <laughs> of all the roles that you've had before or since, uh, you will, will be remembered, to, with lots of people, of course, as, as Rodney. Mm -hmm. They shout uh, Rodney and Plonker in public, Oh, too. yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I do for nothing, yes. Yes, all the time. Do you mind that? Um, well, if I minded it, it wouldn't stop it, so um, there's no point. I'm not even sure I hear it anymore, telling the absolute truth. Is there any affinity at all between you and Rodney? Not really. No, I don't think so. I suppose I'm, I'm awkward in, in certain ways. If, if anyone's going to break something doing the washing up, it's going to be me. Um, oh, you wash up, do you? Oh, of course. Yes, doesn't everyone? <laughs> <laughs> you and David Jason, of course, are great jokers on the screen. Does this yeah. ever continue off screen? It's been known, yes. It's been known. Um, sometimes, because we, we do tend to work pretty hard. Uh, we're up very early and we're working till late at night. So when we do get a day off, it's usually on a Sunday. And, of course, the rest of the country is shut on a Sunday. But there was one occasion when we were filming down in Dorset and we had Sunday off. And we all shot over to a pool, I think it was. And that was shut. The pool was shut on Sunday. Except for this um, joke shop where they sold these <laughs> incredibly realistic pools of plastic thick. <laughs> Which I bought, and uh, later on, I uh, arranged to meet David Jason down in the hotel bar, and we're going to have some food and things. And I left this sick outside his hotel door, because mine was directly opposite his, and I was squinting through the keyhole, waiting for him to come out and say, oh, gosh, you know, there's some sick, and how dreadful, and all that, thinking how wonderful and wacky that would be. And David had already gone. David had left his hotel room and gone down to the bar <laughs> beforehand. So I got fed up with that. And as I was leaving, I saw this chap, another resident of the hotel, come past, see it, and go down to reception. So I picked it up, put it back in his bag, and went down to the bar to meet David. I'm there having a drink with him, and I heard this chap say, somebody's been dreadfully ill outside room 7 <laughs> <laughs> and send a cleaner up. So this cleaner went up, was gone for about 15 minutes, came back down and said, there's no bleeding sick up there, he must be mad. <laughs> We're still looking for this phantom yes, vomit. still phantom vomit in the hotel, I think. But there was the genuine article, wasn't there, where you went on that special filming thing on the trawler? Yes, yes, there was. Uh, when we, we did an episode of Only Fools and Horses called To Hull and Back, where we had part of the plot involved us going out, way out into the North Sea, to ask directions from a gas rig, which way, which way hold the book, which apparently happens in real life. It happens to the old rig people all the time. But... Uh, BBC, being terribly time and motion efficient, has decided, well, whilst we're on our way out to this gas rig, and it was a four-hour trip out and a four-hour trip back, and it really was the North Sea, uh, they said, we'll do all the filming for all the other bits as well, all the bits on the boat, we will do on the way out to the rig, shoot the gas rig, and then do the rest on the way back to Hull. We thought, fine, lovely day, beautiful sunny day, 17 crew members, off we went, trolling out, started acting and shouting and pulling faces and whatever we had to do. 
And gradually, a couple of the crew started getting just slightly green about here. And then some of the makeup people just started feeling a little bit hot and sweaty. And I'm there snapping away with my camera saying, oh, it's me seasick. <laughs> uh, Buster um, wasn't very well. <laughs> Buster who plays Uncle Albert. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I've got a great picture of him. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, there were five people left out of a crew of 17 that, that were actually working. Did you just abandon the whole thing? We tried to do as m much as we could. The makeup girl was pulling focus on the camera and doing the clapperboard as well. And being sick? Yeah, and being sick. <laughs> Uh, you, have, you have this lugubrious face. Yes, but I you... must look that word up. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> That's one of my favourites. But you are, you are definitely, take my word for it, lugubrious. lugubrious. Okay. But you're a great giggler, too, aren't you? Have you ever actually stopped the show by giggling? Um, nearly. That's all I'm going to say in case the bosses are watching. <laughs> are you, yes. Wasn't there a certain line, though, that you couldn't get out? Must have been. Oh, yes. That was um, in Only Fools and Horses. Uh, we got an award for it, actually. We got a, a Golden Egg Award for um, nine takes it took just to say four words. What were those four words? Something about, I think, you've sucked up our urn. <laughs> <laughs> you had to be there. <laughs> now, you've made your West End debut, haven't you, in The, in the Foreigner. Yeah. Uh, there's no chance for retakes on that, of course. Have no. You, have you corpsed on that? Yes. <laughs> very, very quietly. It, it was... A, terrible thing. It's a hundred to one chance. But there's a particular scene where things get a little bit tense, a little bit violent. And the chap, I won't mention any names, but he throws me down on, on a table and then storms out, opens up the door, says a few words, slams the door and leaves. No, leaves and slams the door. That's right, otherwise he walks through the door. And he... yeah. <laughs> that would make you corpse. <laughs> <obsessed. laughs> anyway, he did this, but we all got terribly violent. He slammed me down on the table and he said whatever he wanted to say. And went up to the door, wham! The whole thing came off in his hand. The entire door <laughs> came off in his hand. Like, you try and keep it straight. And as well as he did, I <laughs> He's all right. He could get off. Yeah. He just looked at us all <laughs> and left. <laughs> We're the ones who had to carry on the play. Mm, Hammer the door back on. <laughs> I'm told if a phone call, if you get a phone call and someone says four feet and glassy, you yeah. react oh, very violently. What does I've that mean? I've heard that expression for a long time. That's a surfing expression. Four feet and glassy, you should actually say, Michael, four feet offshore and glassy. Uh, uh, see? Four feet offshore and glassy. Yeah, that, that means uh, because I surf the, the waves uh, four feet high, the wind is offshore, so that backs the wave up, gives it more of a shape. And it's a glassy sort of texture, it's not a rough sea. Yeah. I mean, you haven't got much wind resistance yourself, have you? <laughs> <laughs> How much do you do with this? As much as I can. I, I haven't surfed now since September. Because I've been up here. What is your mother's view of this, of your, your wild hobbies and you being a sex symbol? Well, she's been saying things like, I don't know about the sex symbol bit, but she's been saying, uh, why do you do such dangerous things? You've been doing dangerous things since you were six. Why don't you collect stamps or things like that? Uh, well, that's mum's for you. Yes, true. Well, like you, Nicholas, my next guest started as a child acting, and that having sampled The Good Life, she went solo as the mistress, and her recent credits include Chat Show Hostess. Back on the receiving end tonight, Felicity Kendall. Well, I was just talking about Nicholas's mum there, and you've just become a new mum. Oh, I know. Yes, I have. Oh, I know you know. Fourteen. Fourteen. <laughs> fourteen weeks. I can't remember. These beautiful little spidgy legs. And how old is your first child now? Fifteen years. Fifteen years and a brand yeah, new I've one. I've got a big one and a little one, as they say. This, <laughs> this makes you what they call a mature mum. There is a word for that, or a phrase. Yes. No. Well, I think I looked on a thing once, and it, it, it said something like, um, medieval primate or ancient <laughs> primate or something like yes, that. Yes, prima gravidus. That's what it is, you see. <laughs> but you're, you're very old and you shouldn't be doing this, but, but I love it. I Sounds like the wonderful. first course of a meal, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have the prima gravidus, please. <laughs> what about names? Did you have any problems there? Yes, we fought about names several, several nights. There are a lot of trends in names, aren't there? They all seem to be 
uh, either Oliver's or Alexander's at one end, or they're all still Dwayne's and Wayne's and Tracy's. Yes, I like Michael. That's my favourite name. So do I. Mm. <laughs> you can't have another Michael. I mean, you could. But... Your husband is Michael. Mm. That's yes. my favourite name. I love that. Are you pleased with your own name? I think it's terrible. Felicity. Mm. Isn't it? It's just, it's awful. It's the pits. It's always abbreviated, so that's all right. To what? I had an aunt, that's why I was called Christy, who had a lisp, apparently. And my parents didn't know what to call me, because I was called Charlie, because I was a boy. Yes. They didn't know that I was a boy. <laughs> and uh, so I was called Charlie, and then I came out, and I couldn't be. And uh, so my aunt said, well, why do we call her Felicity? And my mother thought this was so sweet, she did. And I've never forgiven her. <laughs> <laughs> So what's the short bit of felicity then? Flick. Well, that's fine. That's quite nice. Yes, I quite like that. Yes. Nicholas is smiling bravely, but I have a feeling the whole subject terrifies you, doesn't it? Of... Yeah, Edward, you might as well be talking what, Turkish, babies? I think. Yeah. You, you don't have babies. A lot of husbands um, are afraid to be there for the birth, and a lot don't enjoy being there for the Were conception. You? But uh, <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> I was there for both on the last. <laughs> But I, there's, uh, there's a nice uh, quote from Nicholas about the two things that terrify you most. What is it? Oh, marriage and sharks, yes. Marriage and sharks. <laughs> are, you a, are you a superwoman? Are you very efficient? No. Frightful. Very bad at everything. I have lists everywhere, and I try to be a superwoman and fail very badly. You're about to become a working mum again, aren't you? Mm, yes, I'm uh, rehearsing a play, a Tom Stoppard play, that's going into the audience. You've done quite a few Stoppards, haven't you? Fourth? This would be the fourth, yes, yeah. yes. Mm. Now, your last... Lucky girl. What was your last West End appearance? Made in Bangkok. Now, that was quite... It was a, a controversial... Well, they say controversial play, yes. Yeah. It was all about um, Bangkok. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> and all what goes on in Bangkok. And obviously this audience doesn't know <laughs> what... <laughs> well, let's give them a clue then. Yes. <laughs> You haven't got a clip, have you? I'm leaving. No. no <laughs> it's a fairly raunchy production. Well, it was, it was outspoken, and it, it was about um, the girls and all what you can, you can buy anything in any form, fashion, or, or whatever. And it was about the exploitation of the girls in, in Bangkok. That was one of the things. And so that's what people talked about. And it was a bit rude and dirty, I suppose. But it was a, I thought it was a very good play. And all the Good Life yeah. fans turned up? I think they were. I hope not all of them. There were a few. <laughs> there was a lady who went down the steps at the Aldwych Theatre, which is where we're going. I hope she won't do it with Tom Sorrow. I'm sure she won't. And she came down the stairs and left at the interval. And she said, um, oh, how terrible. And this at the Aldwych, the house of such famous writing. And she went down, she was horrified. That's nice. Mm. But your parents are theatrical. Are they also unshockable? Oh, I think so. Oh, yes. I mean, they're nothing. I don't know. I suppose I could think something up, but I don't... And not in the theatre, they wouldn't be shocked. I can't think of anything they'd, they'd, they'd um, be cross about. What about you being cross? You're always having labels attached to you. Would you find those irksome? They're qu so far, they've been quite nice labels, so I don't mind. I don't know, it's all right. I, I would quite like somebody to say that I was tall, dark and handsome sometimes, but they never say that. They always say petite and quaint, and I suppose that's, that's not too quaint. bad. <laughs> <laughs> Pert, that's the one. I think I'm getting too old for that, that's one. Pert. I think we've, we've lost that one. But the trouble is, once the journalists get hold of a word, they... they, they come, it comes up again, doesn't it, because they look at the clip.